Hi everybody, uh, welcome to another video on ethics and corporate governance. Today we are going to be looking at uh, the theories of uh, corporate governance. What we will be examining in this video is to have an understanding of the important features of corporate governance. So we will ask the question, what is corporate governance? and what's the impact of corporate governance. Uh, we're also going to be looking at one of the most popular theories out there that has been used in order to um, explain the impact on the development of corporate governance. But first, let's ask the question, why is corporate governance important? Well, the corporate form of business has impacted or our lives in a very uh, comprehensive way. Uh, all aspects of our lives are affected by the company. Uh, you know, a lot of the services that we use uh, are provided by companies. So companies have got a lot of positive Im impact on, our, on ourselves, but companies also, if they are not run properly, uh, would have a negative impact uh, on our lives as well. Sometimes it's an inconvenience, but very often it's more than that. So examples such as the British Petroleum uh, oil spill, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago, uh, you know, the Boeing 737 um, disasters, all have a significant impact on our lives. There are also a lot of other corporate scandals. Uh, the most famous one is Enron, for example. Uh, and this has shown that when companies fail, it's really, it really has a negative impact on our lives. And there is therefore a need to actually control and ensure that the companies are governed in a more uh, effective manner, more efficiently. Hence, the need to uh, look at corporate governance. Hence, governments around the world have got rules and regulations in place to ensure that companies are properly governed. So now let's uh, look at some definitions of what is corporate governance at the end of the day. Uh, let's start with a definition given by Schleifer and Vishni. And essentially, Schleifer and Vishni focuses corporate governance on the suppliers of finance. Uh, and essentially, they are saying that companies should be run in a proper manner so that they can give back adequate returns uh, on the investments of the suppliers of finance. And the suppliers of finance will include both the shareholders as well as the debt providers. Uh, of course, there are some differences. The debt providers are very much protected by law and the um, returns, the interests, uh, that a company needs to return back to the debt providers uh, regulated or governed by contract, governed by law. So they, the debt providers may not be taking as, as much risk as the shareholders. The shareholders take on a lot of risk. Uh, they put in the money into the company and there's no guarantee that the money will be returned and there will be an adequate return. So uh, Schleifer and Vishni's definition implies that shareholders have got a greater uh, risk that they put in into the company and as a result, there's a greater need to assure that shareholders get a, a good return. So Schleifer and Vishni's definitions sort of you know, slant towards the shareholder primacy, the shareholders um, you know, need for corporate governance. So that's one definition uh, by Schleifer and Vishni. Then another definition, perhaps a, a bit more complex definition, is by OECD. And in this definition, uh, you know, they said that corporate governance is a set of relationships between the company's uh, board, uh, which manages the business, and its external stakeholders, for example, the shareholders, and also other stakeholders. This could be customers, suppliers, employees, even the general public, right? So how these relationships are managed is part of 
uh, this idea of corporate governance. And uh, there is also an internal side to the OEC definition whereby corporate governance also includes the structure, how we organize the business, how the board organizes the business to ensure that they achieve uh, their objectives, mostly in maximizing profits of cost, uh, how they, the structure will monitor the performance of the organization so that it can help achieve these objectives that they have set for themselves. So uh, the OECD's definition sort of includes the, the managing of relationship between external people, the shareholders and stakeholders, and the internal organization of the business as well. And finally, we have another interesting definition given by Sir Adrian Cadbury, and uh, where uh, you know Sir Cadbury takes the definition uh, a little bit wider, where uh, it's not just looking at stakeholders and uh, sh uh, you know, shareholders and the internal running of the business, but uh, he's also looking at the relationship between economic goals of the company and the social goals of the company, recognizing that there is a social impact, there is an impact that the company affects uh, in society as well. So there is a need to manage the interests of the individual, could be the individual director, the individual shareholders, um, but also uh, with the greater society. So this is a very interesting definition that expands the impact of companies, uh, not just to the individual, but also to the greater society as well. So if you can look at some of these definitions, you can sort of extract some of the key important features of corporate governance. One is that corporate governance looks at uh, how we organize the, the, the company to embed uh, a system of internal control, a system of policies, processes, check and balances that will help safeguard the assets of the business. Right? Uh, the second important feature would be uh, the need to prevent any particular individual that may become too powerful because they are in control of the business and therefore take advantage of the business. So we want to prevent anyone uh, from taking advantage because of their power and, and, and so that uh, other uh, stakeholders are also protected. Uh, so corporate governance really is how we manage relationships, the complex relationship between the people who run the business, which includes the management, uh, the board of directors, and also the stakeholders, including the shareholders and other stakeholders as well. And uh, corporate governance will also, uh, you know, look at how companies are managed, you know, the, in a way that serves the best interests of shareholders and other stakeholders. Uh, you know, there could be trade-offs, right, because shareholders and other stakeholders may need different things. But how do we manage this so that we can serve the best interests of everyone? And finally, uh, in order to do all these things, uh, you know, the corporate governance will also encourage, uh, you know, information, free information flow, more transparent information, and more responsibility uh, to account uh, by people who are in power, uh, including the managers and the, the directors as well. So these are some of the key features that you should be getting from what is corporate governance. Now let's uh, have a look at as I said, one of the key theories that has been used in order to develop uh, corporate governance uh, rules and regulations. And this theory is called the agency theory. Now, essentially, the agency theory describes the relationship between the principal and the agent, right? So how does this relationship, uh, you know, goes uh, is that the principal perhaps is the one with the funding, and the principal invests in the business and he hires the agent in order to work and run the business on his behalf. Right? So he delegates work to the agent and in return, the agent is expected to run the business well and serve for the benefit of the principal. Right? So that's essentially the contract, that's essentially the agreement uh, that the principal and agent would have. However, because the agent is the one that runs the business on a day-to-day -day basis, 
the agent will have more information about the business, about how the business is being run, uh, than the principal. We call this imbalance of information, information asymmetry. And this information asymmetry would then result in some problems. Why? Because we assume that all of us are economically rational people and all of us would want to benefit ourselves first before we benefit others. So because the agent has more information, then what happens is that because of this self-interest assumption, he's going to take uh, advantage of this situation. He's going to take opportunity to see how he can serve his own benefit first because of the fact that he has more information. So he is likely to misuse his power because he holds so much information for his own advantage. For example, he could pay himself more, he could give himself a larger office, he could uh, you know, you know, say that he needs a large airplane to travel all over the world, uh, which may be unnecessary at the end of the day, but he will take benefits, he will look at ways in order to use his power to his own advantage. And or he may not even work as hard, so he may not even want to uh, you know, take risk to, uh, you know, to ensure that he gets better return uh, because it's too hard of a work and he doesn't want to do that. So he may not act in the best interest of the principal, he may not have the, risk, the same risk appetite as the principal. So all these are going to create uh, problems for the, for the principal. So how does the principal then overcome this? Well, one, one way is uh, to ensure, because he doesn't trust the agent, so to ensure that the agent does his work, to ensure that there's no misuse of power. Uh, maybe the principal will institute a few things in order to monitor the agent. So for example, he will ask the agent to prepare financial reports on a regular basis so that he can check and see whether he's doing uh, well or not. Uh, if he doesn't trust the financial report, then he could ask that the financial report be audited. So all these are going to incur costs, which we call monitoring costs. Uh, then what happens could be that uh, those agents who uh, are, are more trustworthy and they are willing to work hard, but the principal don't trust them. So how do they re increase that trust? So one way would, could be that the agent may spend, use his own money to actually buy shares in the company. So this is going to be a cost that he will have to incur in order to bond with the principal, in order to tell the principal that uh, you know, he is trustworthy. But this will be a cost that he has to incur. Right? So all these bonding and, and monitoring activities is there to, in, to ensure the reduction uh, you know, the, of the problems that could occur to bring the interests of the principal and the agent together. But all these things, um, even if you institute them, may still not be able to reduce all the problems. So whatever is left, you know, that you can't reduce is what we call res residual loss. Residual loss is the loss that you will still incur even if there is a monitoring activity, even if you bond with the principal. So all these costs are what we call agency cost. And agency cost reduces the benefits that will be derived from by the principal, by the owner of that business. All right. So that's essentially what the agency theory is talking about. And the agency theory is also one of the key things that comes out and the key problem it is really the separation between owners and the people, the agent that controls the business because of this information asymmetry, this separation creates agency problem. It results in agency cost and therefore reduces the benefits to the owners. So let's examine this uh, ownership, separation of ownership and control concept, which is a very important concept that is being used in the development of corporate governance rules and regulations. Uh, let's look at um, uh, you know, the studies done by Burl and Means way back in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, essentially what Burl and Means were saying is that when you start up your business, when you, know, the, when you begin your business, let's say you want to start up your own business, um, there is no real uh, separation of ownership and control because 
you are the owner, you are the one that put in the money, and you are going to be the one running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So you own 100% most likely, and you manage 100%. So you and you, both of you are the same person. So there is no conflict of interest and there is no agency problem in this case. All right. And there's no separation of ownership. So there is no agency cost. Right. So so we don't really, you know, in terms of corporate governance, there's no real risk in that. However, as your business grow, uh, you know, over the years, as you develop more and your market grows and you now have more activities, you, you will come to the realization that you can't do your business on your own. You, must, you need more resources and you don't have the resources on your own. So what you will go and do is you go out and get your resources. Uh, and one of the ways by which you can do that is you can list your company. And once you list it on a stock exchange, more people are able to buy your shares and they will be more owners uh, or, you know, of your company. So it, slowly and you know, surely you will find that there is now a greater separation between the owners and the manager. The owners will be other shareholders uh, that is now uh, holding shares. If you are still running the business, you, so you are the manager in control. But sometimes you may also want to sell out. You don't want to be, you know, you, you've worked so hard for, for so many years. So you don't want to continue to manage the business. You just want to be the owner. So you now hire professional managers who now become agents. Uh, so you become the owner and someone else become the, uh, the, the professional managers. And then there is a separation of uh, ownership and control. And then this would result in agency problem. And then you need to incur agency cost again. Right? So that's the whole concept and the evolution uh, that may happen in any organization which regards to the separation of ownership and control. And this is the one, this is the issue that will have an effect on co corporate governance principles. So corporate governance uh, is looking at how to reduce that agency problem, how to mitigate that agency problem. Right? So in summary, what we have explored uh, in this video is what is corporate governance, the importance of corporate governance. Uh, we've looked at one theory that um, sort of is used in the development of uh, corporate governance principles. Uh, we, it's called the agency theory. The whole the key things from agency theory is the separation of, of ownership and control, uh, the, the existence of information asymmetry, and also this idea that the assumption that we all want to serve our best interests and this creates agency problems for us and that's where uh, corporate governance rules and principles will come in uh, at the end of the day all right so i hope that uh, this uh, video is uh, it been, has been useful to explain a little bit in terms of what is corporate governance and one particular theory uh, in corporate governance so till we see you again in the next video thanks for watching and stay safe bye for now